The President of the Foundation, Mr. Imtiaz Bakir Makar, the Board of Governors, dignitaries, guests, sisters, and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon you all. And I feel honored to deliver the 15th lecture of the late Bakir Makar Memorial Lecture. And I do believe that I feel more honored to be standing in front of you, thinking and contemplating about someone who has been able to bridge the divide between the centers of power represented by the elites of politics and the people, and to be a custodian of truth while serving a state. And that is the true statecraft that I do believe that our politicians all over the world are in need for. Today I stand before you after more than two years of what we call the Arab Spring. And regardless of the name and the description of what has happened from the beginning of 2011 in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, and continuing to happen right now in Syria and many other parts of the Arab world, I would like first to go back a little bit in order to put this particular phenomena that we see in front of us and we call the Arab Spring in perspective and context. Because unfortunately, we in media and many in politics have very short memory and we have been embedded in immediacy. So we judge, interpret, forecast events based on the latest news item. So therefore, I have started to hear recently that the Arab Spring, especially in Western media, the Arab Spring has become an Islamic winter. The Arab Spring has become a sectarian war. The Arab Spring has become this and that. Why? Because yesterday there was a car explosion. The day before yesterday there was a quarrel between politicians, and last week there was something like that. Now, one of the problems of journalism, especially news journalism, as I have been involved in and as I have witnessed during the last decade or, uh, or so, that we have minimized history, and we have even sometimes ignored context to an extent that reality has become a puzzle, fragmented, and cannot form a clear picture or roadmap for our politicians or even for our audience. And that is really very serious. This is why I have defended during the last few years a paradigm of thought in media called the journalism of depth that is based on three major pillars. Number one, deep historical understanding of any particular event. Number two, deep understanding of the social and cultural fabric of a society that we are reporting from. And number three, being there in the field. It means that we maximize the presence within the actors, the people in this case, rather than centers of power. 100 years ago, especially after the First World War, this region that we call the Middle East emerged in a new shape and in a new form. But this shape and form was not a result of organic or natural progress within the history of what we call the Arab world or the Islamic Ummah or the South as we come to know the cultural and political South. It was artificial. It was dictated upon us by colonial powers in order to suit their narrow-minded interests. So the map of what we call the Arab world today that consists of 22 states, in fact, was not the choice of the people themselves, but it was what two gentlemen, two ministers, Sykes and Biko, the two people who maybe their names are very well known in the Middle East, especially in the Arab world, of those who have drawn the map, the political map of our region. We were fragmented. 
the collective feeling and sense of our nation was murdered. The natural progress of our history was interrupted. And we came into a point where we are dealing with a creation that we cannot really classify as nation state. We looked around us, we found Turkey emerging as a state within territories and demographic, demographic definition of a nation. So there is a nation state in Turkey. And then also next to us, there was a nation state in a country called Iran. But within the Arab countries, we did not really experience something called nation states. We had territorial entities, sometimes tribally based, sometimes geographically based, sometimes actually it was based only on mere interest of the West, of fragmenting a wealthy region like the Gulf and creating certain kind of entities in order to uh, resist any temptation from the domestic people or from the Arabs in order to have control over their wealth or to have over control over their destiny. In short, I can tell you that we have been experiencing during the last 100 years one of the greatest insults of our history. The fact that we have never been able to act or to work upon our collective identity or our future aspirations or our genuine progress within the reign of politics and history. We have been, unfortunately, dictated upon and we have been led by regimes that were regarded as puppets for the Americans and puppets for the West and regimes that have forsaken any attachment with the goals of our nations. So this is why the concept of nation, the concept of a state in the Arab world is very fragile. And this is why the people in the Arab world did not really give legitimacy to the state. Because this is an alien creature that came to ruin the fabric of the society. So you will have borders going through one particular town, splitting a brother from his brother, giving one of them certain nationality and his brother another nationality. And therefore, later on, while governments are trying to force us to embrace national identities, sub-identities within these particular entities, we were suffering confrontations, wars. We were suffering all kind of conflicts to forge fake identity and to sacrifice the overall arching values of our society, the collective one that we have inherited during the last 1,400 to 1,500 years, which we are proud of. So now you have a nation that has a great legacy in history, but has very bad and cheap interest in the current reality and politics, and very low profile leadership to lead them to, to actualize their future. So that was a great insult. The West, in particular, was deeply involved within us in suppressing any movement towards unity, in suppressing any move towards independence. This is why, from that time until today, 100 years have gone, and leaders that we have are actually deteriorating even much worse than they used to be before. We have seen after 1989, for example, and I was at that time studying international politics in Africa, I have seen how the African societies started to go into democracy. In 1991, 1992, we had 32 countries in Africa implementing multi-partisan democracy, none in the Arab world. We have seen Central Europe emerging from within the Soviet, former Soviet Union, creating new identities and connecting itself with, with, with its interest. We have seen none in the Arab world. So we have seen, instead of trying to go back to our natural progress towards gaining supremacy over our own interest and destiny, we have seen more dictatorship sponsored by the West. We have seen regimes that have been transformed from military dictatorship 
at the 60s and 70s into partisan dictatorship in the 80s and 90s, and then, believe it or not, family dictatorship, and then the single individual dictatorship. We have seen that where? At the heart of the Arab world, in Egypt. The key of our collective consciousness. We have seen that in Tunisia, the most educated population as a nation ruled by a primitive leader, actually, who is not really educated and who does not have any connection with the society, detached from the society. So Zainul Abidin ibn Ali, the president of Tunisia, was an alien to the Tunisian culture of diversity, of liberalism, and of intellect. Husni Mubarak was an alien to the Egyptian culture of being at the center of politics of the Arab world. He marginalized Egypt. He pushed it away from the role that everyone in Egypt and outside Egypt was looking for. We have seen Qaddafi, Muammar Qaddafi. I have seen him myself personally when I met him in 2008 in his tent. And I felt after the meeting that this gentleman has nothing to do with this beautiful, tolerant, magnificent society called Libya. He is an alien creature within this magnificent society. So people have been detached. These kind of people were detached completely from the masses and from the culture, from the natural progress of the society. And they were, in fact, nothing but aliens and at the same time representatives of Western culture. Western culture. We know that the West has established within it great civilization based on participation and political democracy and so on and so forth. When it came to Middle East, we have seen the worst and the most ugly face of Western dominance and hegemony. We did not see the French Revolution face. We did not see the diversity that was celebrated in a moment of time in the West. We have never seen democracy. We have seen the greed. We have seen the amount of treachery and hypocrisy that was inserted within very limited, detached circles of power within societies that were vibrant, so societies that were empowered with deep connection with history, with deep connection with the future, with youthful societies that were looking forward to, to create tolerant and prosperous reality within our countries. That was a great insult. That was never realized that this insult that he is directing against us in the region is going one day to change and create a motivation from within us to topple these regimes and to create a new reality on the ground. For 100 years, we were confronted with great humiliations. The first humiliation, 1948, when we lost Palestine. The second humiliation, 1967, when we lost the rest of Palestine. Then, the occupation of many territories on our land, especially the war against Afghanistan, then the war against Iraq. And I was present that day in Baghdad when the Americans occupied Baghdad, bringing us democracy and freedom, toppling a regime that was not democratic, no doubt about this, but they were trying to achieve their interest through sort of moral cover, which we all of us now know that it was really fake, called democracy. In, 19, in 2003, all of us in the Arab world were weeping in front of the TV stations, witnessing a great capital called Baghdad, one of the greatest cultural and historical centers of humanity, and definitely of Islamic culture, burning in front of our eyes, and seeing the American Marines rejoicing the destruction of our culture and the humiliation of our capital. All of us have seen and have witnessed the war on Gaza and how a regime, which is called an Arab regime, led by Hosni Mubarak, 
and his head of intelligence at that time were in fact present when the minister, the foreign minister of Israel, announced the war in Gaza from the biggest capital of the Arab world, from Cairo, while they were both of them rejoicing and laughing. That was a great humiliation. All of that led to the deep sense of frustration and anger within the circles, the popular circles, especially the youth. I can never say that the Arab Spring came just a simultaneous response to immediate needs of the public. There was a huge accumulation of anger and frustration going from generation to another until it reached a point where there was some kind of will, determination, and means to achieve this revolution, which we call now the Arab Spring. In 2011, the beginning of 2011, we have been expecting a year full of contradictions. The Arab world, 65% of the people, population are under 20. All of them are equipped with new knowledge and education and technology, while their regimes are aging. They have aged to an extent that they were not able to understand what is happening in the circles of the youth. They have been detached completely. Thanks God. These guys never understood that there is something called internet that might really become a weapon in the hand of the marginalized and oppressed to liberate themselves. They couldn't understand what internet is. They, in fact, thought that internet is not going to introduce to our societies, but more of entertainment and the taking people away from politics. That was it. Kids playing games. This is the definition of the internet in the mind of our aging dictatorships. For them, people did not exist. They did exist. They did exist to an extent that when we say that absolute power corrupts absolutely, we have seen this. Hosni Mubarak did elections in 2009. You remember that? And you know in the elections, he did not even, and his government, bother to deceive the masses while they were forging the elections. They did not. They did not see the people. So they did, in fact, forge elections, and they brought a parliament to power without the necessity wit in order to deceive the public in a certain format. They did it abruptly. They did it stupidly. That was too arrogant. You know, then the guys in Tunisia, the, the gentleman and his wife and his in-laws and relatives who took over the country, they started grooming themselves to stay in power perpetually. So although Zain al-Abidin ibn Ali did not have children to inherit like Husni Mubarak and like Ali Abdullah Saleh of Yemen or like Qaddafi of Libya, he was actually promoting his wife or one of his in-laws to take over. All of us in the Arab world, we were not viewed by our dictators as any source of power. We are trivial. We are marginal. We are nothing. So they can do whatever they wish, whatever they do, whenever they like, without any confrontation with the masses. With that, there was also aging opposition. The opposition of the Arab world that came from long march and confrontation with the state was completely exhausted, was completely also out of the possibility to renovate or to create a new discourse or paradigm of thinking. They have reached a point, these aging opposition, freedom fighters, and great leaders, they reached the point as well that they wanted to end their life in peace with the state. So there was a game by the end of the 90s and the beginning of the last of this century. There was some kind of understanding between our political elite on both sides, the opposition and the government, that you know there is a ceiling of confrontation that no one must go above. Finished. So I am opposition and you are the state. As the state, you can do whatever you wish and allow me a margin to say whatever I want and believe me, I'm not going to harm you and please don't put a lot of my comrades in jail. Simple. That was the formula. So the youth 
were lost within two aging elites. And the youth did not believe that working within traditional movements and organizations could lead us into proper liberation of our political systems. They were frustrated. Most of our political groups and movements witnessed very low recruitment amongst the youth in politics during the 90s and the beginning of, of, of 2000. They couldn't find a lot of interested youth. Not because youth are not interested in their future. Youth are not convinced that these are the right circles to struggle through in order to achieve proper democracy. While we were at that stage of deadlock, something new happened, something called networking, social networking, internet. And suddenly, we have seen young people communicating with each other. At the first stage, maybe they did communicate to play games, as Hosni Mubarak used to describe the youth in a Tahrir Square, kids. OK, some kids were playing games. But these kids who are playing games have started to feel that this connectivity amongst themselves could be utilized for something even much more important than entertainment. They have started to realize that they are forming their own circles and the spheres of action and their virtual societies that are first free from all packages attached to our political parties. You don't have to be from a certain tribe to join the network. You don't have to be from a certain family or, or wealth status or from any particular background. You don't have to even to declare your identity when you become a member of a network. You don't have to bother if you are a male or a female. So networks created democratic environment within the Arab world before the youth were able to transfer this democratic model from the virtual realm into the actual political era or arena. So this is how things started. Then they started utilizing that kind of connection in networking for political reasons sometimes, defending those who have been arrested or tortured, by the way. And the issue of torture, allow me just to say something about it. We have seen a lot of torture in the Arab world in the 60s, 70s, 80s. But in the 90s and, and, and the beginning of the century, when torture started to be documented inside the cells of our intelligence agencies and police stations and spread through YouTube and Facebook, that had great impact on the psychology of our people. Maybe governments thought that by leaking some of this material, that could scare the rest of the population. In fact, it did not. It did create enthusiasm within youth circles to fight against those who are actually committing these kind of crimes. A generation well-educated, well-equipped with proper networking systems, and has a new imagination that our elders did not have. An imagination of a democratic society celebrating diversity connected to the globe. A generation that was able to see what's happening all over the world around us, inspired by models of success and models of a struggle that our forefathers and our grandfathers and our fathers and our elders did not really see and did not experience. So that was the right atmosphere and the right nest for this magnificent bird, which is called the Arab Spring and the right Revolution. Youth, not ideologically driven, but driven by values, driven by consensus, not by, driven by sectarian or ethnic or religious you know, kind of a classification. They came together, they marched towards the streets, and they protested, and regimes were shocked to see masses, not being able to classify them in a proper manner or deal them with the proper, with the proper tools, in fact, crumbled. Regimes that we have seen, you know, their might, their torture, their jails, their prisons, crumbled within two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And that was something great to see in Tunisia and in Egypt. Later on, we have seen much worse 
than this in Libya when the regime decided to fight the people. And we still see this, of course, in Syria today. We have more than 35,000 Syrian civilians have been murdered by the Syrian government at this stage in order to stop a revolution that every one of us, including the political elite of Syria and those who support them wherever they are, know that is not going to stop. I don't think the Syrian people, after this great sacrifice, in a moment of time can stop this revolution. This revolution will continue until it achieves victory. However, we have great challenges before us. The first challenge that we have is to establish new rules for the new game that we have found ourselves involved in. Our political elite, the new political elite that has started to participate in politics, most of them had great experience in exile or in jail. The Prime Minister of Tunisia spent 18 years in jail, and many of his cabinet as well. Many leaders in Egypt, who we know today, spent also a lot of time in jail, or in hiding, or in movements underground. And the same in Libya. A lot of leaders have been marginalized, most of them have been in jail, and some of them have been as well in exile. It means that we have never been given the time to, to introduce new leadership with great skill of politics. And that is natural and normal and nothing really to worry about. Because I see day after day that our leaders, the new generation of leaders that we have seen recently in Egypt and Tunisia and, and Libya, are really learning these skills. What I am worried about is not whether they will learn politics or not. I am worried that they will learn politics. <laughs> because I'm afraid that without proper paradigm of thinking about politics, we may end imitating our oppressors. We may end repeating same slogans and ideologies and thoughts and ideas and interests like those who have put us in jail or sent us to exile. This is why we did not have a lot of time to contemplate a new paradigm of thinking in, as, as far as politics is concerned in the Middle East. And that is the core of all our troubles at this stage. I think we have in front of us a great opportunity to correct our historical or the historical mistake that happened in the Arab world for the last 100 years. But we have also a great risk of falling in new traps that might lead us into another circle of confrontation unless we find proper paradigm of thinking, proper social or political convention amongst ourselves, social contract and political contract amongst ourselves that actually could lead us to the future. What are these items or slogans or themes for the social and political contract that we need? Number one, we need to shift our focus from the center to the margin. I think politics has a tendency of centralizing power. We know that, all of us, wherever you go. This is a natural, inherent, you know, within politics. Politics loves power. And the power has a tendency of manipulating resources and eventually preventing others from coming close. And that is the seed of dictatorship. That is normal for the last few thousand years, something that we have witnessed all of us. And the actual debate within the philosophy of politics for the last few thousand years, from Plato until today, is how actually to restrain the lust to power by politicians and by rulers. How to restrain them by checks and balances and not allowing that kind of eager lust within them to go and confiscate everyone else's power and to manipulate the power in certain circumstances that lead to the marginalization of everyone. The combination of power and wealth 
and the concentration of power and wealth in the hand of a narrow elite is one of the great diseases that we have in our modern politics. And the fact that we have at this stage, not only in the Arab world, not only in Asia or Africa, but even in the West and the United States of America, this kind of rising alliance between wealth and power that is marginalizing the voice of the people even within democratic systems. This is why we see movements in the states and in Europe emerging within the democratic system demanding new imagination about politics because they could see the corruption happening within the political circles. They could see this monopoly of power and wealth within certain circles, regardless of the shape of democracy, regardless of the institutions of democracy. But definitely, we know that the minority now that control the resources of the world can and is controlling the politics of the world. And that is really very serious, because most of us, the 90% 90, 90 or more, are actually marginalized and not necessarily relevant to the current political or economic system of the world. So within the new emerging paradigm in the Arab world, I do argue that we need to establish systems that really represent the margin, represent the public, not centers of power or centers of wealth. And that needs very strong civil society. That needs independent judiciary. That needs strong, powerful, intellectual discourse and paradigm within our societies, strong universities, that could challenge and question centers of power and needs, above all, independent media, proper independent media, not a media that is co-opted by the state. We have seen in the Arab world all forms of something called free media. What does the free media mean in the Arab world before Al Jazeera and even after Al Jazeera existed in the form of TV stations and channels existed by the states? You are allowed to do certain kind of deceptive independence. So you can you know, criticize certain kind of circuits, you can do certain kind of issues. But eventually, the overall project of media is there to emphasize on the monopoly of power in the hand of the state. People lost confidence in media in our countries. And I must say that people lost confidence in media internationally. And I do think that at the state in the United States of America and in Europe at this stage, news media is not really seen highly by many sectors of the society, but seen as the voice of the powerful and the wealthy. Once the money of the state or the money of those who are close to the state or the money of political parties that are involved in politics are the sole owners of TV stations and radios and newspapers, it means journalists have lost and sacrificed their independence. We have seen this in the Arab world. We have seen how did we struggle within Al Jazeera from 1996 to prove that we are really independent and we are not another conspiracy against the public and the public intelligence. We have been accused of all kinds of accusations. How come? In the Arab world, you can have someone independent. Impossible, because for generations, we have seen nothing but deceptive journalism. We have seen nothing but TV stations promoting the cause of the state. That was one of the crimes against the public consciousness, against the public knowledge and intelligence. Once you confiscate the tool for balanced information, for objective knowledge, you are ruining the very fabric of intellect of your society. We converted our societies into people who either follow conspiracy theories or rumors in order to understand what's happening around them. In both cases, we are harming the collective unity of the society and knowledge of the society, and we are harming even the political elite of the society. Because once government loses the capability of communicating with the public, because the public start losing interest in the channels of communication in forms of TVs and radio stations and in newspapers, that particular government will be classified as something that is a plotting a conspiracy, a corrupt regime hiding something. Even if they do something good, 
and peop people are going to re reinterpret it as something bad. So I always used to say, tell ministers of foreign information when they used to phone protesting against Al Jazeera coverage, we are doing this for the sake of our people and your sake as governments as well. We are trying to save you from people who are going to lose absolute hope in you. And then they will resort to nothing but to violence in order to express their views. Why did we have this phenomenon of terrorism in the Arab world? We had it because the frustration and anger in the hearts of men and women was not being able to express itself in a proper, peaceful manner. People could not voice their opinion. Once you do that, you go to jail. People could not express their thoughts, even gently, even in a hint. So they resorted to violence. And that particular darkness within the human being that might push him towards violence exists and becomes something, actu actualize itself when you cannot debate it, discuss it under the sun. Once you cannot find a place under the sun, you resort to the dark corners and you start plotting conspiracies against your fellow men. That is very serious. The issue of freedom of expression in any society is the sign of creating a healthy society, of a sign of diverting that particular society towards proper, magnificent, tolerant presence where governors, people, society, and the centers of power could really enjoy prosperity and peace. Without it, we are actually plotting against ourselves and creating destruction for our, ourselves. The second issue, which is important as well, besides developing this paradigm of thinking in the Arab world and the region, is the international element within us. I'm speaking to you today in Sri Lanka. You are involved in the non-aligned movement. I have been last week delivering a speech like this one in Pretoria, in South Africa. And South Africa is trying to do something through BRICS. However, I see that within the hegemony of the Western paradigm, international paradigm, it is leaving us or leaving for us very narrow margin to develop ourselves or to develop ourselves within this international system. I think it is the time that the South and countries who have started to regain confidence, it is the time that we start calling for the change of the international system. This international system is greedy. It is oppressive. It is deceptive. And at the same time, it is not just. It is not just to keep the decision of the universe in the hand of a few because they have the wealth and they have their military might. It is not just that those who have fragmented our societies and were the source of misery for most of us because of their colonial, colonial ambitions and colonial legacy, that they should continue leading the new age of the people, the new age of freedom and the new age of those who have revolted against their powers. This is why we will never be able to establish prosperity and independence within our societies without really pressing hard to change the international system and to create more tolerant, more just system. We don't want to see more puppets for the Americans in the Arab world. And they have to learn from now on to deal with the people and their will. We don't want to see again and again new artificial borders dividing the brother from his brother and the town from its sister. We don't want to see more and more of their products and their economy controlling us, sucking our resources, and diverting our wealth to their particular interest. We have a lot of wealth in the Arab world. We have a lot of great human resources. We have a lot of, a lot of agri agricultural and water resources. But I can tell you we have very minimal control over it because of the international system that we are living in. This is why without the West and the Western system and the international system realizing that we are moving and shifting towards a paradigm where people are at the center, not centers of the power, the wealthy and the strong, they are going to continue 
pressing us to the corner. And that is not good for international peace and international tolerance. We don't want to see another Al-Qaeda in our territories. They have never done good to us. But the way that I see things going, I wonder whether are we really going to get rid of all forms of extremism and violence within our societies. This is why I really, I really and sincerely press upon everyone who believes in freedom or tolerance that we should really unite our forces, regardless if we are Arabs, Asians, or Africans, or in Latin America, to regenerate this international society in a just manner, rather than continuing to suffer cons the consequences of battle amongst ourselves against everyone else. Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, the future that we are dreaming is in fact with us. The future has arrived. We have seen the beginning of it. We have seen how the drivers of the taxes in Cairo, who have not been able to utter a word during the previous regime, giving you excellent political analysis in 10 to 15 minutes a drive from the center of the city to any other location. We have seen men and women serving in the restaurants of Tunisia, standing and debating and discussing with the guests deep knowledge about politics and expectation for the future. We have seen liberated men, women, and children voicing their opinion in every corner of our cities and countryside. And we, we have seen as well how the international society and nations inspired by the Arab Spring. We have seen them in London, standing in a square called at tahrir Square. We have seen them in Ethiopia, marching in a square they call, the, call it at tahrir Square. We have seen them in New York, New York, protesting against the monopoly of wealth. We have seen them in the form of movements and intellectuals and many other forms of expression all over the world. This is a new spirit, not in the Arab world. This is the spirit of the future everywhere and wherever you go in this world. We have spearheaded that through the revolution of the youth in Egypt and Tunisia. But I see that the revolution of Tunisia and Egypt is echoing every, in every corner of this earth. And this is why the ownership of the so-called Arab Spring should not be for the Arabs. It is not an issue of, an Arab, of Arabs. It is an issue of that inherent feeling in the souls of men and women to liberate themselves and to regain control over their destiny. We need to celebrate this everywhere we go. And we need to celebrate these values and reconnect with us from Asia to Africa to Latin America, the South that has been marginalized for centuries, enslaved, and the resources that were sucked by centers of power should stop. We need to live like everyone else. Every one of us feels that his brother, wherever he is are, is actually his brother in struggle in order to achieve that kind of independence. We have nothing in our hearts against the Americans. We have nothing against the British or the French or the Germans or the Dutch or anyone living in the North at all, at all. And when that revolution took place in Tahrir Square, how many slogans did you see against America or against the West? None. People were aware of their priorities. And people do not have hatred. But once you timber with their revolution, once you try to use their achievement to confiscate their will and their values, once you try to besiege their dreams, then don't expect people to be soft and nice and great towards you. And this is why my advice always used to be to the Western powers, please, if you can't do anything positive to support the will of the people, don't do anything else. Don't go back to your 200, 300 years of deceptive greed and conspiracies in order to besiege resistance and to besiege independence in our countries. This new trend cannot be stopped.
but it could become very violent if it feels that its hope is demolished. This is why I call upon all those who love freedom and democracy wherever they are, and I see in front of me leaders, religious leaders, and I, can, I say that for religious leaders wherever they are in this world, we have something called the rising Islamism, political Islam. And some circles within media internationally are scaring the world from these new mullahs and these new sheikhs and these new, I don't know who are they, coming in order to create the khilafah and to establish religious societies and to go against other cultures and religions. That is not true. This is utterly nonsense. What we are witnessing in the Arab state, at the Arab world now, is a natural progress of reconnecting with our organic history and past. We are going back to our reality. We have Muslim societies, and these Muslim societies, they have come back to embrace Islam as they know it. And Islam as they know it, and as we know it, has nothing to do with extremism, or confiscating anyone's rights, or trying to establish identity versus others. The Qibts lived with us in Egypt more than 1,400 years at this stage, since Egypt was conquered by the Muslims. And we have never had any problem. The Shia and the Sunnah lived in Iraq for centuries without any problem. The Christians lived in Damascus, in Syria, even before Islam, from the beginning of a Christianity, when they were the disciples of, of Jesus, peace be upon him. We had no problem. We have churches that were persecuted by other churches all over the world, but they only continue to exist in, in Baghdad. Many churches, small ones, that were not allowed to flourish in the Christian world, they did actually exist within our societies. We have a mosaic of cultures. We have a mosaic of religions and ethnicities. We have Arabs and Kurds and Barbar and Amazigh. We have all forms of human presence in a region that always used to be a, a passage of civilization, where everyone from Alexander to everyone else we used to cross this region and to leave from them many who became part of this fabric of the society. We do not have a pure religious Islamic or pure Arab ethnicities that are living in that particular region. You know that. So we are going back to celebrate unity within diversity. And this is the great slogan, slogan that I've seen here. Unity can be achieved once you celebrate diversity, not when you suppress diversity. Unity can be achieved when you have great goals in front of the nation to aspire for. But once your concentration becomes to your sub-identity, then expect more sub and sub and sub and sub-identities, not within the society only, but within the particular ethnic group or religious group or society or sect. That can end nowhere. That can fragment the society, not into three, four, five big segments, but into hundreds of small pieces that could demolish the very fabric of the society. Yes, we celebrate diversity, but also while we are celebrating diversity, we celebrate it for grand values for the society, for emancipation of our resources, for great freedom for our youth, for a future that we draw over, over, with all of us. So spiritual leaders in particular and religious leaders should celebrate that within us. Religion can be destructive if it is used in a wrong way. It is a tool. It could be one of the greatest source of wars, bloody wars. We have witnessed that. We have witnessed how people killed each other for the sake of religion. But also, once you celebrate the actual values of any religion that we know, the actual values that heaven asked us to represent on earth, I think only peace could come out of that, and only love, and only humanity. And really, within our countries, we are regaining that. You remember, during the regime of Hosni Mubarak, a car exploded. And this is a story that I have been witnessing. A car exploded on the 1st of January 2011. The Christmas, the, 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 uh, the mass that night in Alexandria, 
and the car exploded, killed more than 100 Christians. And then, definitely, a lot of us in media, unfortunately, and many others, started thinking of this incident as a result of the Salafi Islamic attack against the Christians, celebrating their mass. And I remember our correspondent was interviewing people in the scene, and he interviewed a Muslim woman. He asked her, who you think was behind it? She said, who beside the state has an interest in fragmenting us? I thought maybe she is a little bit emotional. I, I mean, it's difficult. A state could really send a car to explode in a church and to, this, to kill many people like that. It is now that we know that the Minister of Home Affairs of Husni Mubarak was actually the guy who plotted that particular explosion. And that woman was right. It was the state that was aiming at destroying the fabric of the society so they do not unite against tyranny and dictatorship. And the guy now is in jail in front of the court because of that particular crime. So here, I would call upon everyone in religious circles and in politics to always remember that what will remain is the legacy. We are st standing here today commemorating someone who has been involved in politics and who has given us moral reason to stand before you and to travel from the Middle East here to celebrate his and to commemorate his memory in a form of concentrating on values. What remains from any political leader or any religious leader is that legacy he leaves behind, the good legacy that enables us all to be proud of him and to be proud of his achievement. If that doesn't happen, then where is Husni Mubarak of today? Where is Zainul Abidin ibn Ali of today? Where is Muammar al-Qaddafi of today? Where are they? Who would love to associate himself with a legacy like that? But also, where is Nelson Mandela that we all love and appreciate and seen liberating this country with a great, great and a huge moral stance? Thank you very much.